Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Thank you for joining us today uh, for the third event of a five now five part series on the two, 2024 Super Year of Elections. I am Eski Eski Osterk and I'm the Community Manager of Global Governance Community of Practice. And today we are bringing this session to you in collaboration with Global Policy Center uh, on Governance in Oslo and the Democratic Institutions and Processes team based out of Global Governance um, in New York. And today's session, continuing naturally and organically from the last session, uh, which delve deeper into information integrity, uh, will also focus on strengthening information integrity during elections. However, today we will delve deeper into the role digital solutions play in um, addressing some of the some of the dangers uh, around civic space and hate speech. And in doing so, we will be introducing the digital kit for democracy. We will present the functions and features of some of the digital tools available to us, namely iVerify and eMonitor Plus. We will share lessons learned from recent implementations uh, coming out of Peru and coming out of Sierra Leone. Uh, and finally, we will be we, we are hoping that there's going to be ample time uh, dedicated to Q and A uh, to promote a bit more cross thematic and peer to peer exchange on this subject. Without further ado, I would like to invite Aleida Ferreira, Global Lead on Democratic Institutions and Processes, um, out of Global Team based in New York for setting the context further and contextualizing this conversation within the broader integrated governance narrative. Over to you, Aleida. Thank you, Eski, and, and hello, colleagues. Uh, nice to, to have the chance to continue the conversation. As, as you know, this year is uh, what is, has been called the super election year. It's two, over 2 billion people uh, in 72 countries, uh, half of the adult a population of the globe will have the chance to vote. And a third uh, of the countries in Africa will head to the polls. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, in, in the midst of uh, really uh, high levels of, of public distrust in uh, polarization, uh, uh, information, disinf uh, disinformation, and violence. And so, uh, the, the 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 electoral processes that we are having this year are not uh, in in a way are are framed in 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 this context, uh, but they are also an opportunity and uh, for for us to to uh, to amplify the the work that we are doing. Uh, we are currently working in approximately forty to forty five countries around the globe, and twenty of those will have elections uh, this year. And uh, what we are, are doing through the work that many of you do in, in, in the field is to try to make these processes more credible, more inclusive, more uh, peaceful. And uh, some of the, the, the areas that, that we are uh, really uh, focusing in terms of the credibility of, of the electoral processes is adding on uh, our work on information integrity around electoral processes. And many of you use these digital tools that we are going to present today uh, as a one, a one part of the, of the, of the response in, 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 in the field. Um, we, uh, I, I don't want to take much uh, time for, 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 from these opening remarks, but just to say that this is in, in, in a way complemented by all the other efforts that we do in terms of uh, a electoral integrity and inclusion, but also more broadly on governance. So for us uh, and for these elections also to, to, to be relevant, we need to, to emphasize issues of uh, 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 an inclusive civic space, uh, a, Issues of rule of law, rule of issues of of uh, gender equality, etc. And so, uh, 
we will continue with the series and we will try to uh, approach in the in the coming weeks also from different angles all this uh, work that we are doing in terms of of electoral assistance and governance more broadly. Uh, so I will stay here and I will pass the, the floor to Osama, I think, that will focus on, on, on the digital tools. Yeah, thank you yeah, very thank much, you. Uh, Anida. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everybody. My name is Osama and I work as a digital democracy specialist at UNDB governance team based in New York. And really a big part of my work focuses on issues related to uh, information integrity and in democratic institutions and processes. Um, actually, before discussing the digital kit for democracy, I think it's really important for us to highlight here the danger of this information on democratic processes. I, 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 I think some of you are already aware of this, but the World Economic Forum identified AI-generated misinformation as one of the most significant short-term global risks. And whether or not, I know that some people don't really agree with this, but with the World Economic Forum report, but it's clear for us that our information ecosystem is fragile, especially with the rates of generative AI, which is making it faster and easier to anyone to manipulate and produce content. And, and this is really the context in which the Digital Kit for Democracy was developed. The goal is really to expand our internal, but also our partners' capacity to respond to, 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 to these challenges and others. Um, so when, when it comes to the Digital Kit for Demo Democracy, we, we offer different digital tools to promote, uh, Aleida mentioned uh, these, credible, inclusive, and peaceful democratic institutions and processes. And as we know, to have demo a credible democratic institutions and processes, we need to have a healthy information ecosystem. This is why the kit focuses and offers different tools and methodologies on specifically on information integrity, uh, which are used again to expand our partners' capacities nationally in both. Number one, monitoring and analyzing online and offline discourse. And this is how we do it with eMonitor Plus, which will be presented soon by Alvaro, but also verifying the accuracy of information. And this is how we do it with iVerify, which also Sari and colleagues will speak about it. Uh, I, I think it's also important here to highlight that um, the, the kit offers also other tools that we will not really speak about them uh, in, in this specific session, but they are really focusing on other related issues, including the peacefulness and the, 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 the inclusivity of the democratic institutions and processes. This includes the I report for early warning uh, violence detection, but also I participate for the pro promotion of youth uh, participation. Uh, I think maybe some of the colleagues can maybe drop uh, in, the, in uh, the links in the chat box here so can, the colleagues can uh, see them. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in general, like, I, I think it's an important note here to highlight that when speaking about these different tools and when we deploy these tools, we don't think about them as standalone solutions, but rather as a part of a comprehensive response, which includes usually uh, the mapping of the existing initiatives, the uh, need assessment, capacity building, and trainings on issues related to their verification of the accuracy of the content, detection of hate speech and misinformation, etc., but also media literacy and awareness and communication efforts, because we, we are aware that communication is a critical part when, when deploying such uh, uh, tools. Uh, as I pass uh, the, the, the mic to my colleagues, uh, Alvaro and Sari to speak about eMonitor Plus and iVerify. Uh, a final note here that these tools are being developed and deployed by UNDV governance team. With, and we do this in partnership with the chief digital office and UNDV country offices. And until this moment, uh, the kit has been deployed in more than 20 countries, processing millions of online content and verifying uh, and detecting thousands of hate speech and gender-based uh, uh, violence uh, content, and but also fact-checking thousands of uh, online content. I will stop here, colleagues, but happy to speak more about this and the tools further in the Q&A. Over to you, Esgi. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Osama, and thanks to colleagues for joining. And we will be shortly sharing the links to more information about the, the, the resources shared by Osama so far. And we will now invite, first and foremost, Sare and Sagar. Sare uh, is joining, Sare Knope is joining us from Brussels. 
uh, as electoral assistance specialist and the project manager for the SELECT initiative and also joined by Sagar Adhikari. I hope I'm not butchering your name, Sagar, who is the iVerify specialist in Sierra Leone. Um, it will be great if you guys could share with us a bit of an overview of how this tool came to uh, use to relevance uh, and timeliness in your specific context in Sierra Leone. And what were the limitations you've shared, uh, experienced as you battled uh, to implement? And I guess also a second layered question following up, if you could sort of reflect further on the use case, what were the key results achieved? Uh, how do you measure impacts and how do you assess the impact at the broader national level? Over to you, Sare and Sagar. See your next slide. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, SV, and good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Sari Knopa. I work uh, as part of Aleda's team uh, sitting in our Brussels office um, and have been working for the past years on, um, on electoral assistance, but specifically on uh, supporting uh, in the implementation of iVerify in a number of of context. I hope you can see my screen well. Um, yes, great, perfect. So I will not uh, be very long uh, and I would like to hand over quickly to Sagar because I think it's most interesting to listen to a case study and to learn from our experience in a particular context. But just to set the stage before handing over to, to him uh, and to hear more uh, uh, on ASCII, what you, you asked us to, to speak about the lessons and the impact that the iVerify system has had in the context of Sierra Leone. Um, so just very briefly uh, to introduce to colleagues that may not be familiar with the system and the platform. Uh, so iVerify has been developed uh, uh, as a joint effort between the elections team and our chief digital office. Uh, mainly with the objective of strengthening capacity, fact checking capacity of national stakeholders in various national contexts where we've rolled out the platform so far and we're reaching nine uh, currently with a number of countries in progress. Um, so really at the core of it, I verify is, is a fact checking platform. Uh, it has a backend, uh, let's say a a workspace that allows uh, individuals, fact checkers, to um, to analyze the information that they're receiving, so to identify potential misleading or harmful content, um, and then to prioritize it and to draft responses uh, to it, uh, which is then published on a public-facing website, but also shared via social media and through other means, including as well here in the context of Sierra, Le Sierra Leone uh, radio. Uh, an important feature of the iVerify system is that it, it integrates tip lines, allowing for citizens to share content that they would like to see verified. Um, I think if someone could just mute because I'm hearing some background. Yes, thanks, Sagar. Um, uh, so as I said, important component is, is this tip lines uh, or these tip lines integrated, allowing citizens to share content that they would like to see verified and then get a response to um, once the fact checkers have verified the content. Uh, beyond it, I verify being a digital platform, it also comes with, um, with specific support, including communication support and uh, capacity building for those that are using the platform. Um, and so, so far, as I mentioned, we have implemented in about nine countries, starting with our first implementation in 2021 um, in Zambia, and then following in a number of contexts, uh, mainly on the African continent, but also beyond, including in Honduras, Pakistan and currently North Macedonia. But uh, we will now hear from Sagar, who's based in Sierra Leone, and we've been working very closely together, but he's leading um, from UNDP side uh, our, our efforts in 
uh, implementing iVerify in country and working very closely with the national counterparts that are implementing it. So he has a lot to share about some of the lessons, challenges and opportunities. So Sagar, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Esgi, and thank you, Sari, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. I am uh, Sagar Adhikari, the iVerify specialist in Sierra Leone, and I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity to share uh, what we've been doing here in Sierra Leone. Uh, so um, I'll start with the background. Uh, everybody knows that uh, nowadays due to the rapid advancements of uh, social media, internet and artificial intelligence, you know, this has had a profound effect on the communication system uh, globally. It has ensured that information flows and gets shared between people very quickly, you know, in the blink of an eye. So while this has many advantages on one hand, you know, it encourages two-way interaction between political parties and the, and, and the general common people, but then there are obviously so many risks that are associated with it. So, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, because these kind of, you know, information, unverified information, they could be misleading or even polarizing at times with, you know, there could be some possible ramifications for the harmony and sociopolitical peace. So that is why to counter this, uh, we have introduced this platform here in Sierra Leone. Uh, so it it's almost one year now. Uh, last year, on 5th of April 2023, we we launched the platform here with partnership with uh, three uh, media organizations. One is LAS, the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists. The second is the Independent Radio Network. And the third is the BBC Media Action. I will also explain their roles briefly uh, in the next slide. Uh, to popularize our platform, I've, we've also developed a uh, 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 I verify music video uh, by collaborating with a popular local band and I've just shared the link in the chat so after the session is over if you are interested you can go and visit our song we have approximately 70,000 views on YouTube so far next slide please okay so let me just uh, briefly explain the role of our implementing partners. Um, obviously, uh, as I just said, SLAS, they're one of the hosts and they're the host of the platform. Uh, so what we have in SLAS is that this is where the office has been set up and uh, we have a team of 10 journalists working to make this platform a success. Uh, we have two coordinators and eight fact checkers. Uh, so what we do is whenever there's any request for information that needs to be fact checked or when our own team, you know, we also monitor social media and traditional media. So when we see something that needs to be fact checked, what we do is the coordinators assign those stories to one of the fact checkers. The fact checker conducts the fact checking job and then the coordinator assigns the same story to another level of fact checker and finally he himself reviews it and then publishes it so what we have is a three layer of fact checking what this does is you know reduces or you know negates any chances of political biasness and also make sure that our information is correct so as you can see in the table in the side so we have the responsibilities of the first fact checker second fact checkers and the coordinator so they not only fact check and share but then we also monitor the various social media platforms as well as mainstream media for possible information that can be fact checked uh, next slide please well, the second implementing partners are the independent radio network. So um, see, this is a network of more than 60 radio stations throughout the country. And in Sierra Leone, radio is the most commonly used platform by citizens for information communications. And you can see it in the diagram at the side that, uh, you know, in 2022, approximately 69% of the people listen to the radio, whereas only 28% watch TV, uh, only a third of the population, they have access to the internet and um, two thirds of the people, they have mobile phones. So obviously as radio was the most common means, we thought it was necessary and especially in the uh, regional and district areas, uh, we, we thought it would be useful to publicize our stories uh, through radio. So what we have done is uh, we honored weekly radio programs to disseminate fact check stories and programs which help in promoting media literacy and civic and voter education uh, during elections. So um, we had uh, one weekly radio programs every week and during the month of the elections, we had three radio programs. So they not only uh, broadcasted fact check stories, but also, you know, helped uh, the audience uh, inform voters and then, you know, in encouraged um, uh, promo uh, promoting critical thinking. Uh, they encouraged discussions among 
among the general public and kind of was also an educating platform for the people to know how to fact check a per certain particular story or the method or the sources that they can rely on to make sure that those information that is being circulated uh, uh, with, within the wider audience is, is accurate and not coming from unreliable and unreliable sources and making sure that they are not fake or authentic. Uh, can we have a uh, next slide, please? Okay, the BBC Media Action. So we also partnered with BBC Media Action. They have been providing trainings to, um, you know, they provide training to 267 people. They included all youth, people with disabilities, journalists, social media influencers, everyone. So they they, they introduced the concept of uh, fact-checking and, and digital media literacy. So basically, uh, they train these people how to fact check the sources to rely on and and the techniques that they should implement. And they also produce some social media content to build awareness on media literacy because uh, BBC Media Action have the largest number of followers in Sierra Leone for any organization in Facebook. So, so this was quite useful for them, for us. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the, um, the basic uh, IT structure of iVerify system. So obviously there are four layers as you can all see. So first is obviously for someone to identify that a certain information needs to be fact-checked. So it can be done as you can all see by the general public, it can be done by our team, the SLAS, or it can be done by some of our partner institutions. So there are different ways how they can share those information with us. They can go through the website. They can also reach out to us through Facebook and Twitter handles. And there's also this um, crowd angle, but then this crowd angle wasn't necessarily used here in Sierra Leone because we faced certain technical difficulties. And so we couldn't really work with crowd angle. And the third is obviously the fact checking platform, which is done at the SLAS office. And then once we fact check a certain information, then we disseminate that through uh, the IRN radio station, the iVerify website, as well as uh, social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, now I would like to briefly discuss the impact that the I Verify had uh, in Sierra Leone. So, uh, so according to many observers, including um the EU Elections Observation Mission, you know they 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 thought that uh, I Verify played a really uh, critical role, in making sure that there was a control in spread of mis and disinformation during uh, the general elections, and they also issued a press release. Uh, saying and you know complimenting our work so uh, which is nice and 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 to date our team has successfully fact checked 265 stories and there were two critical phases in Sierra Leone during this time one was during the elections week around the elections period a uh, few days before and few days after and the second was uh, as some of you may know in November we had an attempted coup here in Sierra Leone so during that you know two weeks period uh, there was a lot of violence happening you know so many uh, prisoners they managed to escape prison and so so the situation was quite tense here in pretum so even during that time i think i verify uh, played a critical role and uh, so and and also you know it's not only about the stories that we have checked you know so it's not only about the 265 stories there were also certain narratives that were being developed at certain critical junctions so for example right after elections and before the results were being announced you know there are so many fake news circulating that a certain candidate has won. And especially, you know, this was uh, spread by supporters of the opposition party that the president and, and his supporters, his, his candidates, they had lost. And, you know, all kinds of rumors were being spread. So uh, so we also countered some of those claims as much as possible. And uh, uh, also during, you know, uh, the, the, the coup, attempted coup, there was, uh, as I said, the situation was not good. So so there was a curfew in place. So, I mean, there were also lots of questions regarding, you know, whether cur curfew had been implemented or not and the timings and everything, you know, it kept on changing on a weekly basis. So we kind of countered all of that also. So um, that is that. So, um, uh, and we also observed because uh, in September last uh, last year, after the uh, elections, we had a lesson learned workshop, and 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 uh, it was also acknowledged by you know um, all media partners and civil societies and everyone that awareness of the platform also led to a reduction in up, uh, unsubstantiated claims by politicians, which was also quite interesting to note because this was something that other people also shared with us. And the website analytics report provided by UNDP digital office, you know, indicates that we had 514,000 hits uh, between 5th of April, the date of the launch, until July 31st, so one month after elections. 
and uh, you can see uh, you know the traffic to the site peaked during elections month uh, where we had approximately 130,000 people and uh, almost uh, 30,000 in July 10,000 in May and 23,000 in April so these are the people that actually visited the sites but what we have also been doing is that we've been sharing information through social media also so not everybody is interested to do actually go and visit these sites you know they just look at the headings of our um, of our content and then know what's happening or whether it's true or false so uh, but if they are also interested to find out how we reached to that particular con uh, conclusion and the processes that were involved in verifying that particular piece of information then they visited our site so so there were a lot of more people that actually you know viewed uh, the, our outputs but obviously that we cannot necessarily indicate because uh, we do not have that capacity right now uh, next slide please Okay, so um, there were certain uh, key observations that that was made uh, during uh, this period. So um, the first and foremost was that um, the platform matters. So people here trust and will share information from radio, from TV without checking. And this is based on the perception that radio and TV outlets only share verified information, but they wouldn't add easily trust information from social media or messaging apps. So likewise, their trust in interpersonal sources like religious leaders is as and family members and friends was also high because uh, they thought that they were reliable sources. The second thing was um, the least trusted sources for information on politics is social media and in particular Facebook because uh, because many believe that uh, Facebook is prone to biasness and, uh, and, and it is not regulated. So, you know, people can just share whatever they want. A third was that uh, youth politicians and bloggers were identified uh, as the biggest source of mis- and disinformation. So participants said that this was probably because politicians use uh, the youths and bloggers as a tool to propagate disinformation, you know, irrespective of the consequences to get their way into power. And and the fourth and the final finding was that, you know, people do not, some people, not all, but some people do not find sharing information uh, and, you know, disinformation as long as it favors their cause you know so like it regards to elections if a certain piece of information would enhance their preferred candidate or party's chances of winning or or getting in a position of power but even if that particular information is false people still share it uh so yeah next slide thank you uh, uh there are a few other observations that sorry also Apologies, Sagar. If we could wrap up, we want to save time for colleagues to okay, also okay. Just address give me some two, questions. Two. Okay, just a sure, minute. Thank you. Yes. Just, just one minute. Okay. So what we've also observed is that uh, our platform was quite user friendly. You know, people could just go to our website and send uh, links to fact check and also social media. So, but that and during elections time, you know, we we obviously divided our group into three a team into three groups to make sure that we were fact checking. You know, twenty four hours for like the week, and then also the 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 our public outreach through radio programs was widely successful, and their guests estimate uh, is that approximately 100, uh, 1 million people uh, tune in to listen to I Verify radio programs, but they do not have scientific method to exactly measure these figures. These were estimates provided by uh, the radio coordinators. Next slide, slide please. Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, next slide. It's there, no? The uh, next slide. Okay. But uh, the last one, recommendations and opportunities. I do not see it on my screen. Uh, okay. Yes, the okay, last yeah, yeah, one fine. we see. Yeah, okay. okay, okay, finally, yes, I can see. My internet is a bit slow here, so so apologies for that. So obviously now, you know, um, let me just wrap up this quickly. Um, uh, you know, we now have discussed that it is important to fact check information beyond election politics and governance. So anything that is of interest to the general public, we've decided to fact check that. So it could be anything, you know, from uh, fuel prices to information saying that the electricity distribution authority are distributing free electricity, you know, vaccines coming into the country, different other information that are also being fact-checked. We've also realized the need to um, collaborate with government agencies and election management bodies to make sure that they respond to our uh, information requests quickly because this is something that is very, you know, slow in this country. People are not necessarily very friendly with the concept of fact-checking. So there's very little information that gets shared to us. 
and uh, obviously we can obviously include in, increase public awareness uh, there's obviously room for improvement in technology uh, we can collaborate with other fact checking organizations in the region and one thing what we've also noticed is that it can be beneficial if we can uh, have this platform in multiple languages because here right now in Sierra Leone we only have the platform digitally in English and the radio programs are in Creo which is obviously the most spoken language but uh, even though the, the, the platform is in English there are many people who understand spoken English but cannot read and right so you know so what gets shared it's a, it's not of much use to some of these people so they were saying but they can read and write trio so 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 this was also a suggestion that 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 has come up so this is it from from my side thank you everyone thank you sagar and sorry this is a brilliant overview very <laughs> congested um summary of the the journey you have had and with valuable recommendations, practical recommendations for other context-specific adoption of um, iVerify. We appreciate the, the, the level of care you put into um, curating the presentation. Um, I'm sure colleagues online have some questions, uh, particularly as this is a great example of how digital solutions promote more adaptive and resilient governance systems. Um, but without further ado, I would like to first welcome Alvaro Beltran Urrutia, Digital Democracy Associate based in Panama, Panama Regional Hub, to share the experience for eMonitor Plus. And then we can take up the questions um, regarding implementation of both tools. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure this one is also there to a lot of context-specific recommendations as well. Over to you, Alvaro. Thank you, Eski, and, and thanks everyone for, for being here in this conversation. Um, I've structured this presentation in three parts. There is a first introduction that I'm trying to gonna keep brief uh, around eMotor Plus, what it is and, and why we think it provides a added value, not just, you know, um, in a context of not having a tool like this in the country, but also against some commercial alternatives for social media analyzing, which is what Emerge Plus does. Then the second part of the conversation is going to be the way that in the specific case of Peru, data is being leveraged and how it's being applied for different kinds of analysis. And the third part is uh, a, a grab up of the results and, and what we're seeing is working in the country um, to hopefully inspire some of you to, to think of different ways in which this kind of tool can be used in your specific context. So um, we have been discussing, you know, this, this whole conversation around uh, the fact that extreme political polarization has become a common challenge across all of our country offices. Like there, there is no need to further explain that because I mean, I, I think that uh, we are all experiencing that not, not just in the context of governance work, but you know, in, in the many different ways of UNDP work, um, we, we are seeing how polarization is making things slower, is making our impact uh, being challenged, et cetera. Uh, however, what we are not often discussing is the, you know, the, the, the very intricate connection between extreme political polarization and disinformation and hate speech and gender-based violence and toxic communication. And what we are seeing, of course, is that obviously this kind of communication, this, these forms of communication are getting quickly expanded through social media. Um, however, when we discuss with our country offices and our partners uh, at country level, what, how they're doing, because I mean, obviously, let, let's make something clear. Social media analysis is not something new, and it's not something new for many of your country offices. Um, so uh, we wanted to understand in the specific context of social media analysis, what was the, the biggest pain? What was the biggest difficulties that the countries were facing? And so we made a, some, some questions to national partners and we identified four recurring things that were happening. The first one is that social media analysis was being applied to the specific context of institutions. So let's say uh, I am, you know, I am a electoral management board, but uh, body. Um, I, I'm only mapping the information regarding to my institution, to my leaders and stuff, uh, and, and you know, and, and that creates a very fractured analysis of what's going on in the context of polarization and digital violence. Uh, let's say I am a UN agency. I will probably will only be mapping information regarding to my organization and topics that are you know relevant to my organization. But there will be many blind spots, and and those are the blind spots that end up you know creating a, you know that that end up becoming a greater disinformation and and toxic environments. 
The second thing is that most of the responses that we were seeing were mostly um, just reactive. So we saw something that was, you know, incorrect. And so we published a, I don't know, a, a press report or we, we saw something that was wrong and we responded to it. The preventive work, the way that, you know, insights or analytics that will guide us into, you know, preventing um, or, or, or making sure that, you know, those disinformation narratives do not get installed or get, you know, that they, they, they take root in society. We are not providing that kind of information that, that allows us to, to be prevented. This, the third part, and, and mostly, you know, uh, in, in Global South countries, we're seeing, we're seeing that academic knowledge on this topic, uh, it's still very scarce. Like even when it, this has become like a huge issue for all of our country offices, we're seeing uh, very, very limited amounts of, of, of publications regarding this, but also we're seeing very little uh, partnerships between UN agencies and specifically UNDP country offices and academic uh, bodies that are working on this topic. And the, the fourth part, which I think it's, it's critical to what we're doing is that most of the technology that is employed in this kind of work was developed for commercial purposes. It was developed for brands to understand if people were wanting to buy them or not, but it was not designed for political topics like the ones that we are trying to, to understand and analyze and work around. Um, and that's why we designed Emoji Plus. Emoji Plus um, changes some of these things by, by providing four core, I'm gonna say, um, features. The first one is that it leverages some I'm gonna say very important global partnerships that we have achieved as UNDP to get access to levels of data that will otherwise be very costly for country offices. And we get data from Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube, and even some websites that we understand are you know, high in, in their disinformation narratives. Um, and, that, and all of that is automated, which already makes life so much easier for people who are working on this, who you know, in many country offices that we visit, we see them doing this work manually. Yeah, visiting uh, Twitter profiles and Facebook profiles day by day on you know on, a, on an eight hour day basis and you know that is a very manual intensive labor that can be shifted into more analytical work when all of that processing is done automatically. However, there are some scenarios in which we think manual collection of information is still very relevant, um, and that's why we also have within Emoito Plus the capacity to upload. Offline, uh, you know, upload content that is uh, identified manually, and and we have deployed different strategies in, in, in to, to capture that kind of information systematically. The second part, which I think it's 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 a core differentiator of Emoito Plus and other commercial um, alternatives, is the fact that we are using partnerships again with with uh, artificial intelligence companies to get access to algorithms that specifically try to predict if a specific text has toxic communication forms within it. Let's say specifically insults or attacks on identity or gender-based violence or potential of radicalization. Like all of these algorithms and, and there, uh, there are 11 different categories that are being mapped within Immortal Plus. Um, we, we get a prediction of whether the text may, con may contain any of these, you know, I'm gonna say problematic forms of discourse. However, like even beyond these, um, these partnerships that we have with AI companies, UNDP ourselves are developing uh, artificial intelligence to be able to specifically target some more, I'm gonna say, nuanced parts of the discourse. Like for example, when we discuss hate speech, uh, hate speech is a, is a concept that is very um, contested uh, across, not, not even you know globally, even within the UN, it's a very contested term. So uh, we, we have trained our own models to respond to uh, a UN approach to hate speech that is in line with the way that, you know, like our current publishing is talking about it um, and, and it's working really well. So that is the second layer. The third feature is that we allow for what's called data annotation. So um, what we're seeing around the world is that AI systems uh, are, are super effective in mapping and understanding huge quantities of information, but they're not perfect. And they should never you know, be taken at face value in every single prediction that they do. So we work with human monitors to make sure that all of the potential false positives that are getting mixed within the you know, problematic discourse analysis uh, gets verified by humans before they go into analysis. And the second thing is that there are parts of, of you know, uh, there, there are important bits of information that are qualitative in nature and therefore cannot really be easily predicted by AI systems. Let's say, for example, um, an AI system may have a, a an, an easier time trying to predict if, you know, 
the the publisher of a post is uh, male or female or you know an institution that's non-gendered or whatever like that may be easier for an ai system it's harder for an ai system to understand if a person being attacked in a post is a journalist or a rights defender or some or a different category that might be relevant for a un office to 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 be able to identify clearly so um that's where human monitors add additional qualitative data to make sure that all of that is part of the analysis as well. And then we have a bunch of um, tools that allow for visualization and communication. And that part of the system is just making everyone's life easier through dashboards and through easily, uh, I'm gonna say, customizable parts of the system. So summing up, this is sort of like the way that, that we are trying to push this. Uh, it's, it's a mix of computational and human analysis to make the analysis of these public conversations much easier first through capture robots to get you the data that you need automatically. Second, by giving you uh, an ease of mind by having a lot of AI systems and uh, pre-analyze the text. So you, could, you don't have to focus, let's say on 10,000 publications a day, but you can just focus on the 500 that are more problematic, 600 that are more problematic. Then we have a human team that makes sure that everything is you know, neatly presented and the data is correct and everything's verified. Uh, and then with all of that pre, you know, I'm gonna say pre-cleaning of the data, you can go into decision-making and communications, which again, makes everything so much easier. So let's see how everything, like all of these plays out in the context of Peru. Sorry, not just Peru. <laughs> this is the six countries that we're working on, uh, that, that the system is currently working on. Uh, that's Peru, Tunisia, Libya, Lebanon, Panama, and Mozambique. And we have more than 100 monitors working across all of these countries with more than 2 million pieces of content that has been analyzed so far. Now, let's go into Peru. Um, so one of the first things that I want to, oh, sorry, that I want to showcase is that uh, the, every single e-monitorable implementation uh, requires partnerships. And those partnerships has to be very tailored to the specific context. Oops, sorry. I'm going to rush because that was my 10-minute mark. <laughs> Um, so in the context of Peru, we were working with Amayuya, which is a, a network of more than 20 media outlets. Um, and they were focused on fact-checking, but with Imointo Plus, they started creating capacities for social media analysis and hate speech mapping specifically. Uh, and they are, our, they are our muscle. They are the ones making sure that you know, the system is being applied on a daily basis and we get the data that's correct. And those are our human monitors. And our second partner is Transparencia. Transparencia is a CSO that is an official electoral observer. So there are connections with the, I'm gonna say international landscape uh, on, on electoral observance. And uh, I'm gonna discuss this later, but um, in, in a broad uh, reference, their role is to make sure that all of their data ends up being part of our the, the official electoral observation in the country. Uh, and we are the technological partners. We make sure that the technology is working well and that everyone understands how to operate it and, and whatever. Uh, and also we, we are sort of like, a, a set way in between you know, the local needs and the global team that's working in-house on this system. So their needs become innovation priorities for us. Um, this is sort of what was happen happening in Peru. This is six months of data. We analyzed close to 300,000 publications, uh, mapped close to 15,000 cases of toxic communication, uh, identified more than 6,000 cases of hate speech. When, uh, our data allowed us to identify that ideological affiliation and in particular political affiliation was the core motivator of hate speech in our current conversation, um, that gender-based violence was mostly used uh, through insults. The system allows us to do this. Uh, in, in the left, we're seeing all of the people that are being attacked in this six month period. Uh, and on the right, we're seeing the words that are most commonly used to attack them. So the system also allows me to, for example, uh, Peru has, I'm gonna say, a recent history of, of terrorism in, in the country. And therefore that word is very, very strong in our, in our context. I'm sorry, I'm Peruvian, by the way. That's, that's why I'm talking like I'm, I'm based here. Um, so um, the, the word most used in the current political conversation to invalidate, to discriminate, to get someone out of the conversation is to call them a terrorist. And we're seeing that people who are marching on the streets in the context of Peru are the ones that have been most targeted by this word. However, uh, they're not the only ones. We're seeing people, uh, we're seeing journalists, we're seeing international organizations, we're seeing people who are leaving universities and all of these people are being you know, delegitimized by being called terrorists. Um, we, I, I can also do the other, the other way around. So for example, uh, I'm mapping here all of the words that are used to attack a journalist in the country who is called Juliana Oxenford. Um, and 
that's all of the information that in the six months are used just to attack the her. Um, in the country, we've also done thematic reports. In this case, this was one on digital violence against journalists. And this is some of the insights that came out of the reports uh, out of more than a thousand cases of digital violence that we found um, in, in, in the context of Peru. I, I wanna just wrap up this, this my, my presentation by four things in which I think are uh, the, the, the information that we provided to remote class is contributing to more programmatic results. Because I think that when we're doing social media analysis, um, there is always a risk of just you know having those dashboards and having those reports and just putting them in, in a drawer somewhere that forget, forgetting about it. But I think the, specific, the, the case of Peru is, has highlighted some of the ways in which this can be quickly translated into programmatic work. The first one is that all these insights are being included into electoral observation documentation. And again, this is true transparency. Transparency is, is, our, is our partner to make sure that all of our insights are, are currently informing the international community around the, the ways that, I'm sorry, I'm real um, But yeah, they're informing the international community around the way that, that uh, hate speech and text communication are being used in the context of campaigning and in the context of the political discourse in the country. The second thing is that, um, we are expanding the capacity of journalist networks to map violence against journalists and media outlets. And, and I, I even have like a, a, a very brief um, anecdote on this case. Like uh, I think it was like July last year, uh, the, the, the National Association of Journalists was presenting their semestral report on violence against journalists and they had identified 70 cases. And we went with Imojo Plus data and we were like, okay, that's great. I mean, that's obviously a, a very important, you know, discovery. We have 500 additional cases that we have discovered using Imojo Plus data. And so that that kind of cooperation is obviously very important for them. And uh, the, the country office has even further strengthened that 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 connection by including the national the Peruvian National Association of Journalists as part as, as an official member of the project board of the electoral project that uses Imojo Plus. The third thing is that um, I'm going to say for, for one of the first times in the country, uh, the three electoral management bodies that are working in Peru uh, have created a joint structure to respond to the electoral mis misinformation and toxic communication that we are identifying with Monitor Plus. Uh, obviously, they were doing this work on their own, but they were doing it manually and it was very inefficient. So having like a, a source of information that quickly, you know, points into the direction in which they have to respond it has been a, a huge benefit for them. Um, and I think one of the things that, that, that the country office is, 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 is pushing hard is to expand the conversation about the way that technology is facilitating both hate speech and gender-based violence. There's been specific, special reports on this. There's been, you know, like e even some of the concepts that we're using, like hate speech, toxic communication, are pretty new for the Peruvian context. And I think that, that there's an, an ongoing and, and quite ambitious education campaign that's being uh, pushed from, from Emo Plus and the country office to make sure that, that, that those things become part of our, our political discourse and, and debate. That's it, colleagues. That's for kids for my side. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alvaro. I mean, both these presentations are so rich in, in content. And I do have a feeling that for the, the newbies uh, into the field, it, it presents great opportunity for in, insights for learning. Um, I am now opening the floor for any questions our colleagues, participants may have. I did see that Mamoon had one reflection and action request from the UN system at large. Um, and he calls for a global monitor on toxic communication, gender-based violence, hate speech, and disinformation. Quite a fact. Um, as we give the audience maybe to kind of uh, shift the, the gear and to reconsider questions, I am going to exploit um, my position. And I have two questions, and I think both, you, both of you could potentially address it in whichever order you would like to take it. But one question, in, in both implementation processes, there is a huge emphasis on multi-stakeholder engagement and collaboration. Um, and as the UNDP generally sort of gets natural lead in convening and driving forward uh, the collaboration. I wanted to ask in terms of the sequencing, usually where does the demand for these types of adoption processes 
where does the demand originate? It might differ from one case to another, but in your specific experiences, if you could speak to the demand side of uh, the picture, that will be helpful. And a second question uh, I had is about scaling. Alvaro, in your presentation, you did provide a bigger picture that went beyond peril. So do we currently, as UNDP, have um, any plans, any investments in scaling up efforts and what channels, what mediums exist for promoting maybe potentially South-South cooperation on generating learnings? And then the third question I have is working on with these digital solutions and platforms, it gives us access to a great deal of data information to assess perceptions and to kind of to understand um, more evidence-based solutions for informing decision-making. Uh, and I did want to inquire if we have a global space where this data is stored um, or effectively used. And Neef and others may also have responses to these questions if they're not just single story specific, but over to you, Alvaro, Sagar, Sara, in whichever order you would like to take it. We have about 10 minutes. I can I can share some thoughts. Uh, sorry, do you feel the fine? Okay, cool. Um, so I think that one of the things, one of the learnings that we have, not, not just from the countries that are currently implementing Moira Plus, but also from the countries that we are, uh, you know, discussing about maybe starting an implementation soon, is that we see a lot of capacity and we see a lot of angst from the information integrity, you know, partners at, at country level. And, and they're doing amazing things and they're, they're, all, they're all very concerned about these things, but they're also feeling a lot of this connection. They feel like, you know, they're working, you know, around the clock and they're making, they're making these amazing contributions. And they feel like, you know, the, the information pollution is, is just, you know, winning the fight and they cannot do anything about it. So I think um, even beyond, you know, just, just the capacity or the technology, I think there is a, a huge necessity at country level for connection and to make sure that, that they can, you know, uh, connect and, and, and share their knowledge and maybe, you know, work together with people and organizations that are doing similar things. And like you're mentioning, Eski, I think UNDP is in an amazing position to be able to push these kind of connections. Uh, as, as the need, was mentioned probably in, in, in the last session. Um, we, we have this this um, approach called a National Coalition for Information Integrity. And I think that that specific model is, is very helpful for country offices to, to understand how can that they can easier, that they can make part, partnering more, more easier at a country level and also how they can um, not just, you know, reinvent the wheel. They can, you know, uh, take the learning from, from the global level and apply them at the national level. And, and again, I, I think that that's what we're trying to do more and more often in our in our national implementations. That being said, um, if, um, I, again, I, I think every single UNDP office is, is, is facing the challenge of disinformation and hate speech. I, I, I don't think at, at this point in the conversation it's going to be, uh, it will be anomalous, I, I think, to, to, to have a country that says that that's not an issue, that, that it's not happening in their country. Um, so I think that the best way to, to you know, think about I, if Imoint if Plus or iVerify are a good fit for your specific needs is to discuss it with the electoral focal points at a regional level. Um, so we have Luis Martinez Latanzos in, in Panama, we have Tatiana and Robert in Africa, we have... Um, Oh, I'm, I'm missing the name of the guy in Asia. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, we have, uh, we Daniel, have you know, Daniel. Oh, Daniel, Daniel. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. If he's around, please like let's not say that I said that. Whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that that's a really good focal point uh, to, to be able to start the discussion around um, what, what's, what's needed. However, as Osama was mentioning at the beginning, uh, we're trying to standardize a way in which we make uh, needs assessment missions in, in a streamlined way. So we understand the same, we're, 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 you know, mapping for the same KPIs, we're mapping for the same specific indicators, and, and we try to analyze it in, in a comparable manner. So, so we know where to, you know, take things from and, and what's going to be the easier learning path for each, specific, for each specific country. And in that specific mission, we always map the potential partners that are coming into the system. So we, like, for example, uh, I, I think that a mantra that we have to have as, as, as UNDP is 
that we are not trying to, you know, impose technologies or impose, you know, specific solutions. If we see something that's really working on a country level, let's say on fact checking or maybe on communications around hate speech, let's take that and integrate it into a system. Like we don't need to apply every single part of our tools in a country. We just need to upgrade those capacities that are potentially already in the, in the country. So I think that's the second layer. And and I agree with you on the data. I think we have to think about the best way to showcase and 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 you know match the specific way of of data that's being collected, and make sure that we have um, a global perspective and a regional perspective that that you know it allows for better decision making for us as 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 UNDP first, but also as a UN system. I I think that uh, UNDP has I'm gonna say maybe I'm mistaken, but I think we are showcasing a lot of leadership in this uh, area of information integrity. Uh, and we can definitely help uh, not just our country offices, but also other other UN bodies in in making sure that they understand this issue better. Yeah, that's it from me. Thanks, thanks a lot, Alvaro. And uh, Sarai, would you like to come in? Sure, uh, I'll be very brief because I think Alvaro mentioned a lot of important points, but I just wanted to sort of re-emphasize the importance of this assessment mission that Alvaro also highlighted whereby we look at the uh, information landscape and the challenges, but also at what already exists at country level, different initiatives that um, have already uh, commenced prior to us engaging on, on this topic or uh, prior on uh, to us thinking about potentially implementing one or the other tool. Um, and, in, and in response also to your point on partnerships uh, and coalition building, I think in the context of Sierra Leone, um, the, the, this idea emerged uh, as a risk mitigation strategy, also because of course the, the um, partners that we work with uh, are then prone to being uh, targeted uh, because they may put out um, uh, sort of uh, counter messages uh, that that individuals that uh, started uh, sharing this disinformation may not be very pleased with them uh, doing so. And so the idea emerged that when we build a coalition and we have a number of partners working together, it will become easier for them to, to stand their ground and help each other out uh, when it gets difficult. So that was also one of the reasons behind this coalition, specifically in Sierra Leone. In other contexts, the assessment pointed to uh, potentially a single actor, but we always indeed, as you highlighted, uh, try to, to build coalitions or work with a number of, of actors as there are different mandates. Some may be better uh, positioned to work on the identification, other may be more on the response. Um, so, so that's really behind uh, this this partnership building, and I think the other questions were well answered by Alvaro. Uh, I don't know, so I know we're running out of time, so maybe yes. others have questions too. Yes, thank you, Sarah. No, I, in the interest of time, we will now hand over to Neet Hanafin, Senior Advisor on Information Integrity based uh, out of Global Policy Center on Governance Oslo but physically in New York, over to you, Neve, for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Eski, and thanks to the team for, for two really great and, and thorough overviews of the two tools. I hope colleagues are, are coming away with some thoughts and ideas on, on how these kind of systems can be applicable in their contexts. Um, so I, I guess I, 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 in the interest of time, I, I'm going to raise three points around uh, both of these tools. I, I think the first is the question of sustainability. Um, we really need to be conscious of the fact that that deploying the, these tools into a, 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 an information ecosystem with the partnerships and the financing and the, the levels of effort required, it's really important that you're thinking in advance about how you want to sustain the systems beyond the a particular elections, for example. And we've seen really great examples of that yeah, in, on, in both of these systems, but this really needs to be planned in advance. Um, the second is that there are conditions for the success of these tools, right? Like you, you need to have, as as Sari and Sagar mentioned, and, and others, really strong um, local partners that have a, a real commitment to this work and an understanding of the information ecosystem and strong networks to be able to to 
um, engage others in and, and get buy-in for the work that you're doing. Um, timing is really important, right? Like, you know, we, we've, we've had examples where some of these tools have been deployed a little bit too late and then you have a real trouble getting getting sort of public awareness of the the, the great work that the, and the data that's been um, produced by them. Um, and you know there are there are there are really like a whole range of considerations, and this is one of the things that the Global Policy Center, for example, looked at last year together with with the iVerify team. We actually developed a, a monitoring and evaluation framework, which I strongly recommend that you you look at if you're also considering the the deployment of of either of these tools. It gives you a really good overview of of what you need to take into consideration as you move forward. Um, and then the third thing I would just say is that there are there are you know risks and limitations also, and we need to be aware of those. We need to understand the environment that we're deploying these tools in. We need to understand how to protect the the, the data and the pr privacy of those who have produced that data, um, and how to ensure that that the, that data is not going to be used for 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 other means. So all of these I think are are, are really important um, considerations as we as we move into deployment. Um, I would say that there are some, uh, I'm not on this call, but I think there's some really great examples of, of, I would say, like legacy deployments of both of these tools in some other countries. So I really encourage you to reach out to both teams and, and have a conversation with them about uh, about some of the earlier deployments and how well they have been sustained and, and, and what they're doing now, because some of them are doing some really interesting things. And I think it's Alvaro who mentioned, or, or Sagar who mentioned that, you know, beyond elections, they're now looking at all kinds of other, you know, issues of public interest. And I think that's what makes these tools really really powerful and a really um, important addition to any governance uh, or peace building program. So um, with that note, and in the interest of time, I will I will end there. Um, I just wanted to, to highlight that there is one more um, session, our fourth session coming up on this series next week. This is focusing on youth inclusive political processes. It's taking place on Tuesday, 9th of April. So please put that in your calendars. I think that's also going to be a really important um, perspective on, on the elections uh, discussions that, that uh, the team has been organizing. So thank you so much for, for joining and um, we'll see you at the next session. Bye-bye. Thanks, thank you. Steve. And thank you. great thanks to Thank you. Office and Digital Community of Practice for collaborating with us in the delivery of this conversation. Over to everyone. Thank Great you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.